Psalm 115, please. Last week, Pastor Byron took us to Psalm 100. I'd like to stay in Israel's songbook. That's what the Psalter is. That's what the book of Psalms is. It's their playlist. It's their hymn book. We are hearing Israel worship in every season of their life. Many of the Psalms, most of the Psalms that have a name with them are written by King David, but not all of them. But they're all music. That's why you can find so many different moods inside of the Psalms. There are Psalms of celebration where you can practically hear the volume of Israel's music, the clamor of the dancing and the shouting and the clapping as they celebrate who God is and what he's done. And then there are painfully dark Psalms, one that that doesn't resolve at all. It just leaves you in the darkness, kind of like jazz music that doesn't resolve at the end. If you're a musician, most music resolves. It gives the listener off the hook with something like, ta-da, and you know it's over. (laughs) There is one psalm where literally it ends in darkness and you turn the page hoping that there's more, and there's not. Why is there a psalm like that? Why does David begin in Psalm 13 calling out to God, wondering how long God will continue to forget him and ignore him, turn his face away from him? Because all of those moods are part of a faithful life following God. It's not all celebration. It's not all joy. So a few notes on the music before we read Psalm 115. The Psalms are the song, are songs in other words, and they have moods and they have messages. The setting can help us understand the lyrics. Often, the little subtitle above the psalm in smaller, often italicized letters will tell you specifically who wrote it and when they wrote it. And with that as a key, you have a much better idea of what's going on. David's psalms in particular sometimes point out a very high point or a very low point in his life. After this happened, while David found himself in this specific situation, he said to the Lord, and here's the song, and now it makes sense. Psalm 115 may have been written after the nation was carried off into captivity. If you look at Psalm 115, there's no note regarding its author, regarding its setting. We don't know. But much of the things that Psalm 115 says would make perfect sense if it was a song Israel composed after they were temporarily deported from their land, carried off by a foreign empire, and in the time they waited for their return, which God had promised them. We can't say for sure but the setting sometimes helps. Here's an example from modern music. A couple of weeks ago, a young singer-songwriter named Taylor Swift re-released some of her music. She released a 10-minute song that made the entire world go crazy. And though I know nothing of Taylor Swift and of her life and in her music, everyone was talking about this, so I went to the source of all knowledge, which is YouTube, and listen to a song that helpfully provided the lyrics so that I couldn't miss what poor little Taylor was singing about. It turned out to be an emotional roller coaster for me. To my own embarrassment, I nearly became a Swifty listening to this song (laughs) because it spoke in very painful, very relatable language of being in a relationship where you find yourself disappointed and betrayed and embarrassed. And anybody who's ever been dumped, and I got dumped a lot before my wife came along and had mercy on me. God answered my prayers and finally sent me the one that is for me. I could relate, and I'm like, this is why people like her. But the really troublesome part was people dug into the lyrics and they identified, they think, the actor who treated our little Taylor this way and started throwing his name around the internet, he may never work again after people get done with him. If you understand the setting, the song makes more sense. There's also some things in the music that will become apparent, especially if you ever did anything like sing in a choir or you've listened to choral singing or they used to take you to mass or some liturgical church setting where there's something called call, something called call and response. 
as we get down to the end of the psalm, again, we don't have the musical notations, we just have the lyrics, but you'll notice the, lyric, the pronouns are doing strange things. And I can almost hear a cantor, one man singing aloud and a choir answering. Or I can hear a few people singing and all the people in the congregation singing one part and all the priests singing another. When I get there, you'll see what I mean. But at the heart of this song, this isn't senseless music. This isn't brainless music. This isn't a catchy hook written to sell us, the rest of us uncultured groups, millions of dollars worth of records and make us pay hundreds of dollars to go to a concert. This is spiritual life. This isn't just a playlist. This is the singing of God's people after him in the middle of their trouble. And the question that is at the heart of Psalm 115 is this. How can we tr keep trusting God when everything seems to be set against us? Israel finds itself, and I'm going to show you that a modern lyric has been poorly written. From the very first lyric, Israel is humbly, quietly signaling, Lord, we're in deep trouble. People don't believe in you because our lives are so miserable. But we will put our trust in you. We will trust you again. We will remember the truth of who you are, and we're going to keep trusting you in these circumstances. Let's read Psalm 115. Let me read it aloud to you. You'll begin to see what I mean, and more importantly, what this psalm means. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Here's the humiliation. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Are you beginning to get the picture? Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Here comes the antiphonal singing. Here comes the call and response. Listen, you can almost hear it. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, anyone, Jew or Gentile is what that means. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord nor do any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And Crosspoint says with Israel, praise the Lord. How can we keep trusting God when it seems that everything is set against us? Psalm 115 teaches us. It's a song with a lesson of faith. And the first and the most important answer is this. We remember always that God is in charge. You see, this psalm is a call for help. It's a humble call for help from humiliated people. If you listen to contemporary praise music, you may not get that idea because of verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Contemporary songwriter who's written some wonderful music had a song 10 or 11 years ago that began with that lyric. It's a great song. It's filled with biblical ideas, but in terms of Psalm 115, that song missed the mood of this one. Because that song is nearly a praise, is nearly a dance tune. It is happy and celebratory, and Psalm 115 is not. If you read verse 2, you'll know that. 
Why should the nation say, where is their God? Do you get the picture? Israel is saying to God, everyone around us is saying, your God's a farce. He doesn't exist. You people claim to know the living God. You noticed how your lives are terrible? You notice the ruin you're in? How you view? notice that we're in charge of you? Again, this would make very good sense if Israel has already been carried off into captivity. But this is essentially their story with very few interruptions their entire life. They're always running from someone. They're always afraid of someone with very few exceptions in their life as a nation in the reign of Solomon specifically, and that didn't last for long. Israel is always being embarrassed, is always being humiliated by the nations around them because they make the foolish mistake of serving the idols of the gods of the nations around them rather than the God who acts according, verse one, to his steadfast love and his faithfulness. The first three verses are a call for help God, because you are steadfastly loving, because you are faithful, please help us. Why should the nations around us say, where is their God? And here is their life-saving answer. Verse three, our God is in the heavens. What does the rest of it say? He does what? All that he pleases. That's one difference between you and God. Do you do everything you please? Buy anything you want? Manage your schedule just the way you want. Run your health, run your life, run your possessions, control your relationships in just the way that is pleasing to you? Absolutely not. God is in heaven. He does everything he wants to do and God helps his people because he's good, not because we are. Please understand that biblical idea. It runs through the entire Bible. The reason Christians are often ashamed and embarrassed and weighed down by the guilt of their sins and feel unworthy to ask God for help is because they do not feel worthy of Him. Here's the biblical truth. We're not. We can't impress Him. There's nothing we can bring into his presence to say, we stand on an equal footing with you. You have to listen to us. That's not Israel's plea at all. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, God, the nations are making fun of us, acting, keeping, not with our need, certainly not in keeping with us deserving it, act in keeping with your steadfast love and your faithfulness because you're the God who's in heaven who does anything and everything he pleases. When you are in most in need of God, in my experience personally and in talking to hundreds of people down through the years, when I am through my own choices, through my own attitudes, through my own sinful behavior, I have removed myself the farthest from God, that's when I least want to talk to him. That's when the Bible stays closed. That's when the prayers dry up. That is when you most need to come to him, remembering that he's going to listen to you, not according to your goodness, but according to his own. God helps people because he's good, not because we are. Daniel understood that. I wanted you to hear Daniel praying. There's no doubt about when Daniel prayed this prayer. He was in actual captivity giving you a lot of biblical ideas here, but while Israel was in captivity, while Daniel had been carried off into slavery in that foreign empire, he was reading the prophet Jeremiah. He was reading the same book that's in your Bible, and he came to understand through reading God's word that the time of their captivity was almost at an end, that they were very close to the time of the restoration. And when David saw that, he was both elated and heartbroken. And in Daniel chapter 9, if you've never read it for yourself, read it this afternoon. Daniel offers one of the most important prayers in the entire Bible. And listen to him pray because it'll give you confidence to approach God on the basis of his goodness, not your own. Daniel chapter 9 says this. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. 
Don't miss this. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. We appeal to God on the basis of two things. He's absolutely in charge, and the God that is in charge is good. A second thing that Psalm 115 teaches us, we remember as Israel did that the substitutes we have for God are utterly worthless. Anything you put in God's place will ultimately disappoint you. It will, feel, it will let you down. It will break your heart. It will betray your trust each and every time. Israel only learned this after the captivity. All their lives, they were idolaters. They only got rid of their idolatry once they had been literally part of the nation had been scattered, never to be regathered. Another part had been carried off into captivity. When they returned, they sought God in earnest. When they returned, they paid careful attention to his word. That's what they learned, and it's reflected here in verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold. I want you to see the contrast. Verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God's in charge. He's above us all. He does anything he wants. On the other hand, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Are you getting the point? What can an idol do for you? Nothing except degrade you. Look at verse 8. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. That's a heavy statement. People who make idols and people who trust idols will become like the idols they made. In other words, lifeless, useless, barren, unimportant, blown away by the wind of history. You say, well, thanks for the history lesson, but we're in the United States in 2021. This is not an idolatrous time. Your laughter tells me that you get the point. Very few of us, many cultures in the world still carve things out of the best materials they can find, whether that's wood or jewelry. They still build shrines. They still take offerings. Many cultures in the world do that. Very few people born in this country and raised in the Western, highly civilized, highly secularized Western culture of the United States do that. But we make our own idols. They're called success. They're called achievement. They're called pleasure. They're called being the envy of the neighborhood. They're called possession. They're called leisure. They're called having enough, knowing enough, being enough that you are in charge of your entire world. This is part of the prison of disobedience that keeps secularized Americans away from God. And the warning is that idol cannot possibly help you. If you give your life to trust in those false ideals, if you turn away from God and trust those idols instead, you will be certainly lost. You will be as lifeless as the idol you gave your life to. The story of the Bible from cover to cover, even before Jesus appeared on earth, is that idols are always vying for men's attention. The attention of men and women on this earth is competed for by their idols, whether they idolize themselves or another person or another belonging or a certain status or a certain achievement, all kinds of things. Call out for your confidence all your life. And the only way to be saved by God is to turn from your idols and trust him instead. This runs right through the Bible. Centuries after Psalm 115 was written, Paul brought the good news of Jesus to a city called Thessalonica in modern day Greece. And he wrote those people after leaving them in a hurry because of persecution, he wrote them a letter and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
Paul told the Thessalonians how they were saved. Listen to it, it'll help you. He said, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he, God, raised from the dead, Jesus, who does what? He delivers us from the wrath to come. How were the Thessalonians saved? By turning away from their physical idols and turning to Jesus who alone can save them. The death and the resurrection of Jesus is the focal and foundational part of all of human history. It is Jesus who saves people the only way. The Israelites, the Thessalonians, and modern day Americans and people all over the world, wherever we're going to send this missions offering, all the idols are different, but they all take people away from God. And the only way to be saved is to turn from them and start trusting God. The trouble is that idols never stop competing for your trust in God. All your life, listen, I've been a Christian almost my entire life by God's grace and through the faithful example and teaching of my parents, I trusted Jesus when I was just a little kid. But to this day, all kinds of things call out for my attention, for my excitement, for my devotion, for my trust, for my passion, more than the Lord who is in heaven, who does everything he pleases. I know this is, a stu- this is an issue for modern day Christians because of what John the Apostle wrote to Christians in the first century. Let me back up so you can see the movement. We've been in the Psalms centuries before Jesus was born. We've made a quick stop in Thessalonica to Greek-speaking people 2,000 years ago where Paul tells them the reason you are saved from the judgment of God is because you turn from the idols to Jesus. In 1 John, one of the last letters written in the entire New Testament, a heartfelt message from the closest of Jesus' apostles says this, 1 John chapter 5. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the true God and eternal life. Here's the last sentence in the whole letter. Would you read it with me? What's it say? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's quite a way to end a letter. I might have ended it before saying the last sentence. It's such a beautiful thing. The life of God, God himself has come. We are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true God. Jesus is eternal life. What a crescendo. John, wrap it up right there. That's beautiful. No. A word of warning. Little children, people who already belong to God, keep yourselves from idols. Even if you've been taught by the Apostle John, even if you've actually placed your trust in Jesus, Idols will always stalk you. How will you identify them? Here I'm depending on the thoughts of others that I read this week, particularly a man named Phil Riken. A thought by Tim Keller. Tim Keller says that what your mind effortlessly goes to when you have nothing else demanding your attention, what you think about most in your hours of leisure, that's your idol. Phil Riken advises that you ask yourself questions like, what are the things that you put before God? What are the things that you put your trust in instead of trusting the Lord? And especially, he says, what angers you? Because idols, people tend to get angry when their idols get knocked off the shelf, he says. If you're self-aware, if you're humble before God, you may recognize that there are things calling out for your attention even today. And none of those things apart from the person of God himself will ever satisfy or protect you or keep their promises to you. Only God can do that. Psalm continues to teach us, number three, that we remember, we keep trusting God when everything seems set against us, when we find ourselves under pressure, we remember that God blesses everyone who trusts him. In verses 9 through 15, it begins this call and response kind of singing. You'll notice that the pronouns change. Verse 9, O Israel, trust in the Lord. 
He is their help and their shield. What I think is happening here is that a small group or her perhaps one person is calling out to Israel in their gathered worship, O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. And then the choir responds, He is their help and shield. O oh, house of Aaron, that's the priests, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear the Lord. That's a catch-all phrase that anyone is invited and anyone is included. Anyone who will revere God and give Him His place and trust Him, they also hear. He is their help and shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. Very important, verse 13, watch. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. Did you notice all the groups? Israel, the priesthood, and anyone who wants to trust the Lord will be heard, will be helped, will be shielded by the Lord. The beauty of this psalm is this. It tells me that the God who is to be feared can be trusted because, verse 1 tells me, He is steadfastly loving and He is very, very faithful. Verse 13 tells me that achievement and status don't matter with Him. I fell in love with verse 13 this week. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. You don't even have to be in the nation of Israel. If you're in the nation of Israel, you don't have to be a priest. If you're among the common people, you don't have to be anyone of any importance, whether you are great and or small in your own eyes or in the eyes of the world the Lord himself will bless, protect, and shield anyone who trusts him. This is vitally important because of what I was telling you earlier. The people who are most desperately in need of God are reluctant to come to him specifically and precisely because they feel their need so greatly. That's exactly when you want to come running to him. When you've embarrassed yourself, when you've defiled yourself, when you've wrecked your conscience and you're filled with regret, that is the time to open your Bible, not let it stay closed on the nightstand. That is the time to call out to God on the basis of His love and His faithfulness. This is a call and a song that teaches us in 18 long verses to trust the Lord. And the final lesson it teaches us is that we can remember to trust God in difficult times if we promise, number four, if we promise to keep praising Him. Verse 16, the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth He has given to the children of man. In other words, it's very poetic. What does it mean? God, you're in charge of everything. You're so far above us, we literally can't see you. You're in heaven doing everything that you please, but you've given the earth to us. Your humble, frail, often sinful, often mistaken, often forgetful creation, you've given us our little time and our little space on earth. And what we're going to do is use the life you've given us to praise you. Verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Let me be very specific and I'm done. We're living in a troublesome, difficult, confusing time in the United States. And I'm not talking about the nation as a whole. I'm talking specifically about Christians. The Bible says that judgment must begin by the house of the Lord. We are accountable to the Lord and we are accountable to each other. And I'm not going to name any names because I don't want to add to the division and I don't want to send you down a YouTube rabbit hole like I've fallen into for about two years. But many Christian leaders who have loved and esteemed and preached the sovereignty of God for years, both ordinary people and pastors and professors and theologians, in the current suffering and pressure that we're all under of every kind, whether it's social or political or economic or relational, they are acting and leading people into a fearful reaction that would make it seem that God is not in heaven and not, is not in charge anymore. That we need to esteem other things, that we have other things that we must take care of for life to be worth living and for God to do what he wants on the earth. The psalmist has the completely opposite idea. 
The nations around us, God, they're taunting us. We are poor and persecuted, surrounded by our enemies. They literally call out to us and say, hey, where's your God anyway? Aren't you the fools who call yourselves God's people? How's that working out for you? God, we will remember that you're in heaven doing everything you want. We're going to ask for your help, not because we deserve it, and not because we've earned it, but because you are so loving and so faithful. See, you have a greater name than Israelite. You're God's own child. Jesus calls you his friend. God calls you his beloved son or daughter. And people who remember who God is and remember what God does can always trust him. The point of idolatry is under the pressure of our current circumstances to turn away from the Lord and to trust someone or something else to get this in order and then we will go back to the God we once knew. No, the dead do not praise the Lord nor do any who go down into the silence. We will bless the Lord from this time forth forevermore. And Crosspoint says with Israel the last phrase, praise the Lord. Let's pray.